So, uh, you guys ready for a little Vogon poetry? Absolutely not, but we can grab our towels and take a look at the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. In the beginning, the universe was created. This has made a lot of people very angry and has been widely regarded as a bad move. There is a theory which states that if ever anyone discovers exactly what the universe is for and why it is here, it'll instantly disappear and be replaced by something even more bizarre and inexplicable. There is another theory which states that this has already happened. Many were increasingly of the opinion that they'd all made a big mistake in coming down from the trees in the first place. And some said that even the trees had been a bad move and that no one should have ever left the oceans. The chances of finding out what's really going on in the universe are so remote, the only thing to do is to hang the sense of it and keep yourself occupied. Space is big. Really big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down the road to the chemist, but that's just peanuts to space. But nothing travels faster than the speed of light, with the possible exception of bad news, and it obeys its own special laws. All you really need to know for the moment is that the universe is a lot more complicated than you might think. And that's even if you start from a position of thinking it's pretty damn complicated in the first place. Don't panic and carry a towel. It's about the most massively useful thing an interstellar hitchhiker can have. Hey, what's up, bookworms and those who seek the answers to life, the universe, and everything? Mike, back today to talk a little Douglas Adams with 1979's The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Now, actually, this was released between 79 and 1992, five books. It's The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, Life, the Universe, and Everything, So Long, and Thanks for All the Fish, and Mostly Harmless. Now, what a lot of people don't know about The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is this actually started as a BBC radio event. It was not actually a book. It came actually became a, a novel afterwards. And since then, it's gone on to make a TV series, video games, comics, a feature-length movie, novelizations, all kinds of things that you can imagine with a franchise this big. Now, guys, I want to say I am only going to be talking about the five books, and really uh, mostly just the first book, because I am trying to tell you guys on why you should read it, so I don't want to tell you about too much that happens afterwards. But I do want you to know I do think that you should read all five of these, but I will not be talking about the uh, additional book. Uh, I think it was by the, the author who wrote Artemis Fowl. Is that what he did? That, that actually came out a few years back. I haven't read it yet, so I can't talk too much about it. I have uh, this apprehension uh, about anybody continuing uh, another author's series uh, you know, outside of like Wheel of Time, but yeah, that's a different conversation. But uh, yeah, I read these books for the first time as a junior high student and I just laughed myself to tears. And it is something that has aged really, really wonderfully because I just reread Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy for Sci-Fi September. I actually read it at the end of August, but uh, it is something that I want to talk about in Sci-Fi September because it's a book that I think has aged wonderfully. And like I said, I still found myself laughing quite a bit, but we're going to talk about why I think you guys should read it, but we're going to begin, like usual, by talking about what is the book about. Now, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy follows the misadventures of the last surviving man, Arthur Dent, following the demolition of Earth by a Vogon constructor fleet to make way for a hyperspace bypass. Dent is rescued from Earth's destruction by Ford Prefect, a human-like alien writer for the eccentric electronic travel guide, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, by hitchhiking onto a passing Vogon spacecraft. 
Following his rescue, Dent explores the galaxy with Prefect and encounters Trillian, another human who had been taken from Earth before its destruction by the two-headed president of the galaxy, Zephod Beeblebrox, and the depressed Marvin, the paranoid android, and that is the beginning of what would become an incredible journey, guys, who over five books, and like I said, started in 1979 with The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Now, we're going to get into, like usual, guys, what makes it good or bad. I'm not going to tell you any lies here. It's going to be predominantly good. I don't have a lot of bad things to say about this, but i got to explain that your expectations have to be in check for something like this. Now, the good, obviously, is that Douglas Adams was a comedic genius. This man could basically tell you the ingredients for uh, what he put in his tea, and he would find a way to make it funny for you. Almost, I, this is not hyperbole when I say almost every other paragraph in this book ends in a joke, and they land almost every single time. From the absolutely ridiculous to the absurd, uh, absurdity is something that he really embraces in this book. Uh, he, he makes it, he makes you laugh every single time. And look, guys, for me, this was something new because this was prior to me watching any like Monty Python movies or anything like that. I hadn't really been exposed to British humor at all, so this was my introduction to it, and it kind of set the bar high. Maybe that's why I struggle a lot sometimes with British humor. It doesn't always land for me, but uh, with this, it really, really works well. And the world he wrote was just quirky enough that I think there was never really a jump the shark moment. A lot of sci-fi novels, you start being like, okay, that just kind of took me out of it because it's ridiculous. Uh, from page one, this is absolutely ridiculous. And uh, I, that's why I think you can have a jump the shark moment when you have things, you know, like the, the last thoughts of a whale, a humpback whale, and talking to a potted plant. You, can, you always have these things that are just like, what in the world? What are you even thinking of? He makes it work somehow, and it makes it very funny. Talking rats, hyper-intelligent dolphins, all of the above. He makes it all work on these pages somehow. And it is played for laughs every single time. And like I said, I find myself laughing all the time. But the strength of this book, obviously, outside of the humor, is the characters, namely the crew of the Heart of Gold. That is their intergalactic spaceship. Uh, with there, we let's talk with our lead. Obviously, Arthur is going to be the one that you mostly follow here. Now, Arthur is a uh, he pretty much encapsulates the everyman perfectly, obviously being the last human alive, or so he thinks. And it, 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 it's, you're able to kind of latch on to him for that reason. You know, you want to see, okay, we're getting to see all these new adventures in outer space stuff that we don't know about with no, without the ever the risk of okay well we're going to go back and we're going to you know we're going to doctor who it we're going to go spend time on earth no we're never going to do that again so we're just going to keep going onward and forwards right and i think that's something that really helped this series because you never had to think of okay it's been two books we should go back to earth now and tell everybody about what's been going on yeah that, that, if there's a good side of there being no more earth i think that might be it but uh his blatant disregard i think arthur's for how absurd this situation is is kind of what gives uh, the character his charm and i think the series the charm he really is just the lifeblood of this series because he's just so relatable and you can really just uh really you just want to sit down and have a cup of tea with the guy because he just he is so friendly and he just he, he the way he just takes everything as it comes he just rolls with it he knows this is ridiculous that makes absolutely no sense must be a Tuesday. You know, that's just kind of the way that he has. And then you got Zaphod Beeblebrox, or Four Eyes, as uh, Arthur calls him, the uh, the president of the galaxy. This guy like, kind of is uh, the fine line between, like, a complete moron and an absolute genius. And it makes you think about, you know, I don't know, maybe sometimes that line really isn't as far as part as you think it is. So uh, a character that I think... Uh, <laughs> it, it, you grow to really like a first year you're it's played for like okay this is just like the obnoxious uh no one should care about this guy but you end up actually giving a damn about what he's doing and i can't get too far into that without getting into spoilers but it's a character that i think at first you might be a little standoffish towards but uh as the series goes on i think you'll really grow to love the character quite a bit and and love his uh boyish charm let's put it that way for prefect uh i think zaphi calls him dumb space cookie <laughs> Something like that. I don't know. It's been a couple of years, guys, since I've read those sequels. Uh, he's there, I think, to help Arthur kind of transition into this new way of life. You know, he's uh, he's befriended him for years on Earth before he knows, uh, you know, his his real, his uh, Beetle Geissian, is that a word? His Beetle Geissian origins there. So uh, that, that way you've got uh, an easy way to transition from the old life into the new life and obviously him being someone who uh, 
does write in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which basically, in my opinion, predicted the Kindle, guys. It really did. It really did predict the Kindle. It's the kind of thing you think in 1979, wow, that was really forward thinking. Uh, but, you know, a, a lot of things like that are fun. And a lot of science fiction has has predicted tablets and stuff. But uh, this is a series everybody's going to say is hilarious and stuff like that. And you shouldn't take it too seriously. And then you start looking at some of these things, you're like, huh, you know, maybe some of these things, uh, uh, he, he was onto something here, but uh, Ford's work in the guide is particularly amusing in helping Arthur adjust. And you got Trill Trillian, uh, hyper intelligent. I think she's there to do the math for everyone. She's uh, a lot of the time she is the smartest person in the room, or basically the only one with a full brain. Uh, but um, I think it also kind of helps uh, Arthur again adjust to being okay. I don't have to live with the weight of I'm the last human alive. Okay, so there is another human. It's just, you know, it, it's not kind of what you expect. I'll just leave it there. You, you guys see, but the relationship that those two build over time is, is, is really special. And uh, I, I think Marvin the Paranoid Android, <laughs> it, believe it or not, is one of the more layered characters in this series. You know, he has a um, uh, this personality software that gives him human emotion. And he, 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 you know, basically when he's he's told things to do things like open the door and pick up garbage and things like that, he thinks it's just below him, and so it just made him massively depressed. And it's um, I, it's one of those things where you feel like, okay, look, depression isn't funny, but somehow he finds ways to make you laugh at this stuff that isn't funny, suicide, depression, things like that. He makes you laugh at these things, and again. I think this laughter is good for the soul, and this book should not be taken seriously on those things. And, uh, you know, sometimes it is okay to look at some of those serious things in life and get a good chuckle out of them, especially uh, some of the things that, that Marvin does. But, uh, yeah, he's a character I think that everyone is going to love uh, almost immediately. It really, to me, is all where I, like I said, where I learned about a lot of the the dry sense of humor that, that, that British humor has. And I, I think it, it helped me kind of adjust to it a lot. But uh, it's more than just the humor here, guys. There are lots of themes in this one. Uh, like I've already mentioned, depression, you know, Arthur missing Earth, uh, Marvin dealing with his lot in life, things like that, accepting defeat. Because let's be honest, guys, losing is funny. And our heroes are going to lose a lot, and it is played for laughs almost every single time. Uh, it really much is almost like when they do have success, it's almost like dumb luck. And I think that that just makes it charming, like I said quite a bit. Uh, exploration, obviously, you're dealing with space travel, and it gets wilder and quirkier and even more strange as the series goes on and on and on. And uh, that's, that's something, obviously, I'm always here for. I mean, I grew up watching Star Trek and stuff, so, you know, exploring strange new lands kind of thing is always something that's been a lot of fun. He plays, he plays it for a, a lot of laughs and a lot of uh, interesting new ideas, communication, is a very big one here. Uh, a lot of things in this are solved by actually talking to one another. And it, unless it's Bogon poetry, like I said, you should never listen to that because that's never going to end well. But I think um, a big theme in this is finding your meaning. You know, um, it's easy to feel really insignificant in this great, you know, infinite universe, you know. So it's really finding your meaning. What What is my meaning of being here? Am I meaningless? Things like that. Uh, it, it's a lot of things that I think that uh, you wouldn't expect uh, kind of deep thoughts in a book quite like this, but I think it is something that comes up quite a bit. And friendship and companionship, obviously, you know, the crew may not all get along at first, but they grow to really care for one another over the course of the series, as all crews in a sci-fi series should, right? But uh, it, again, it never really quite progresses as you expect. There are lots of twists and turns and fun to be had there. Now, I do think that there is some bad things here. I don't think so, but you might. Now, look, some of the humor might not land for you. I think you might have a heart of stone if you think that, but I do accept that not everyone is going to find this as funny as I did if you didn't read it when you were younger. Like I said, I read this when I was younger. I can't separate myself from it. I find it still hilarious. It's like I didn't understand why when I showed my wife The Goonies and she was like in her 30s and she didn't find it just like amazing like I did. And I was like, oh, you didn't watch it when you were seven like I did, you know? So uh, I think it's one of those things, uh, it, you know, you say you're in your 30s or early 40s, something like that, and you're reading this for the first time. You might not find it as funny as some people do. I, I, I still laugh, but like I said, I do admit I might have some nostalgia for it, so there's going to be that. There are some dated references, and look, guys, this book is 43 years old. There's going to be dated references. It's going to happen in any science fiction novel, especially one where he has so many allegorical themes, obviously, of things that he's um, 
I mean, for example, Ford Prefect was, an ex was, a, was a popular car at the time, you know? So uh, there's lots of things like that, I think. I don't think it's anything that's gonna take you out of it. You, in fact, it might actually lead you to Google some of these things, see what in the world he's talking about. And it's just fascinating, some of the things that they were talking about in 1979, right? Uh, some of those pop culture references you might've heard, 42, Life, the Universe, and Everything, uh, So Long, and Thanks for All the Fish, Bring a Towel, Don't Panic, all that stuff that you know before you've even read this, it, you might feel kind of robbed you might feel robbed a little bit that you've heard these things before and you might have built up your expectations so much for those moments and when they come you're just kind of like that's it you know it's, it, these are things that have kind of these sayings have kind of taken on a life of their own as the series has grown over the decades uh, so now when people hear those sayings before they've ever even read this they know these references it might just feel like it kind of falls flat because they're expecting this big epic moment it's nothing like that. It's just lines that people got used to saying and quoting. And that's why you got even things like Elon Musk with his space Tesla putting don't panic on the front of it, you know, stuff like that. So uh, it's just, it's one of those things that uh, you might feel a little robbed that you've had those things kind of stolen from you. But again, uh, nothing that's going to, uh, to ruin anything for you. And then I got to say, I think the sequels are hit and miss. Uh, look, I enjoy all of them, but I, I won't lie. I like Life, the Universe, and Everything, a restaurant at the end of the universe, as much as I like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The other two, uh, they're, they're, they're good, but they don't they don't quite touch those three. So, But again, uh, of the five books, I don't think you're going to find a dud in the bunch. It's just you, you might not enjoy others as much as some of the previous ones. It's going to happen, I think, in any series. Now, let's get into, guys, why I think that you should read it. Now, look. Not all sci-fi has to be super serious, guys. That's the thing I've noticed with a lot of sci-fi readers is when I'm reading some softer sci-fi like my Blake Crouch and stuff like that and Andy Weir have kind of gotten like dunked on by some of the big uh, sci-fi nerds out there who are like, that's not real science fiction. That's Walmart science fiction. Uh, look, if you go into this expecting like quantum theory and stuff, you're going to be disappointed, obviously. This is not that kind of series. And here's my thing. Why does science fiction always have to be so self-serious? You know, so just super, super serious. So I think this is needed because it made science fiction fun again. Not in like a Star Wars adventure kind of fun. And like, I'm laughing. I'm having a great time. And look, people are just so wound tight these days and they read these classic books and they're looking for reasons to be upset, it feels like sometimes. So I think with this, guys, it's just go into it expecting to have a good time, not take it too seriously, and you're going to get a laugh. And I think laughter is something that a lot of people, like I said, that are wound a bit tight to right now about any book that came out before the year 2010, I think it's something that you would really enjoy if you give it a shot. But it's not for any one group of people. That's what I love about it. It don't matter how age you are. It don't matter what race you are. It don't matter what religion you are. It don't matter what gender you are. It doesn't matter. This book is truly for everyone. Everyone's going to find something to love. All ages, old, young, ancient, hell, dead. I don't know. That depends. I, don't, I haven't been there yet, but I don't know. They could be reading this in the afterlife. They probably should. But uh, look, it's a book you can read in like a day or two. It's really, really short. And then decide if you want to go on with the sequels. I think you'll enjoy the sequels if you keep going. You'll have a good time with it. But just commit to reading the first book. Like I said, it's something you can read really, really quick. Even slow readers are finishing this in a couple of days. So uh, if you need your sci-fi to be super serious and ultra-realistic with like if you're that type who, who reads like a science fiction passion, it's like, oh, well, that wouldn't happen because this, this, and this. This probably isn't a series for you. You've just got to go with it. There's some things that are absolutely ridiculous, and Adams never hid from that. He never hid from the absurd. He was embracing the absurd, and God bless him for it. I think it's something that uh, really opened me up to a new uh, brand of sci-fi that I think has never been replicated since. I don't think I've ever read anything nearly as funny as this, much less sci-fi, as funny as this. As for some final thoughts, guys, look, I think this is a story that is just timeless. I could read it again and again and again and never, ever get tired of it. Anytime I need a good laugh, this is the one I pull off the shelf. I've probably read this a good seven, eight times now in my life, and I never, ever tire of it. I can't wait to force it on my kids when they're ready to get to that point in life because uh, it's going to be something I think they're going to do. And I think that the illusion of the story is that sometimes you can feel alone, almost like you're the only person on the planet, right? And maybe you need to step outside of your comfort zone and find some people that you can relate to a little bit. And I think that that's a good uh, way to approach this book. If you haven't read anything like this, maybe it's a good time to step outside of your comfort zone and try something like sci-fi comedy. You know, with Douglas Adams, you're going to get all those things. And that, guys, is why I think that you should read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, one of the greatest 
books of all time. Probably a top 20 book easily for me of all time. And I think you'll enjoy it if you give it a shot. So guys, have you read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Drop in the comments and let me know what you think. And I will talk to you there. So long, and thanks for all the fish. Thank you.